times. So I'll try and tell you about things that work three times in three different samples of people scanned on different scanners, and each time we had non-depressed people to match them. Um, I'll try and let you know when things didn't match as well. The therapies we gave, by the way, this cognitive therapy, it helps people to interrupt negative thinking, and in general, it worked. These were depression severities before therapy for each of our patients. This is after therapy. It went down. To, and this is a level of remission in general. We were getting about 60% of our patients better, which is what most psychotherapy trials find. So to show you the idea that when people who are depressed see something emotional, their amygdala turns on. All the graphs that I show you today will have time here, activity here. In dotted purple lines will be the healthy, never depressed people, and in blue lines, because people don't like when I make depressed people anything but blue, are my depressed people. My controls, healthy people, it's not a very emotional task. You see the word ugly, is it relevant to you? No, it's not emotional, the amygdala doesn't turn on. Depressed people, it turns on and stays on more than the healthy people. If we look at areas like that dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and say, what's it doing? We can identify this area because this area is used every day in manipulating things in memory. So I'll give people a manipulating things in memory task. Here's some numbers. I want you to put them in numerical order. One, three, four, five, seven. As you do that, in healthy people, if I only gave you three numbers to put in order, it would activate a little bit, four numbers, five numbers, more. Healthy people have a lot of activity here. Depressed people don't. Suggesting maybe depressed people aren't using this area as much as the healthy people. Let's take that same area that we found by where is different between depressed and healthy people on this task. Say, what's it doing when we showed them an emotional word? All of a sudden, again, we find Healthy people are using that area. Depressed people aren't activating that area as much. Potentially suggesting that healthy people use this area to help regulate the amygdala. Depressed people don't. Now to show that, I'd really want to show you that what's going on here has something to do with what's going on there. And that's true. If I look at the level of correlation or association between activity in the amygdala, which is recognizing things ba as bad, and prefrontal cortex. In healthy people, the more the amygdala activates, the more you also get that prefrontal control going on. Depressed people, it's not as much related. So more amygdala activity, it's like the car's going and you don't have a brake system. Car without brakes just keeps on going. And I can, in fact, show you that that relationship is all through those medial areas. So the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex might communicate with these ventromedial areas, which then communicates with the amygdala. So we have the basic science of depression. Um, a lot of this is still controversial, but it's at least a story which in our hands is consistent. So far I've told you that depressed people think about negative things. What can we tell our patients? Certainly this is very hard to tell our psychotherapy patients in a way it would be meaningful. But a big part of psychotherapy is telling people that thinking and feeling interact. And I can now tell them it's not just theoretical constructs. Brain mechanisms that are involved with thinking and feeling strongly interact. And maybe not quite right in when you're depressed, so we got to work on that. And that's a good rationale for therapy, and I actually tell my psychotherapy patients that. So if you try and do these kinds of experiments with depressed people and just put the emotional word on the screen and then have them even do the cognitive task of putting numbers in order, as soon as the digits go off, depressed people are back thinking about the emotional word they saw 30 seconds ago, and they have that amygdala activity. You can say, who are these depressed patients who are doing it? And it turns out they're the ones who ruminate. So there are different kinds of rumination. And this is time, and this is stars are where there's an association. 15, 30 seconds out, the people who have amygdala activity are ruminating. This is work done by my student, Darcy Mandel. Um, and that's kind of exciting. I can show you it's also true for the hippocampus, but in the hippocampus, more so for ruminating on an event that happened to you. The hippocampus, again, indexes episodic memory. When you're thinking about episodes, 
in your life or the people who think about negative things that happen to them have that sustained hippocampal activity. Prefrontal cortex, the more you have it, the less you look like a ruminator. These are negative relationships. So, so far so good. More sustained amygdala activity, more like a ruminator. Um, I should let you know that it's not just about negative information. We bring depressed people into the lab and say, think about the best time in your life. Think about the best time you ever had. Tell us about that. And while you're doing that, for the next seven minutes, please rate your mood with a mouse from very negative to very positive. Now, healthy people, their mood goes up. This is their mouse rating. And their health mood goes up, and they stay there for all seven minutes. My depressed people don't get there. It never gets as high, and they don't sustain that positive mood as much. And if you look at my individuals, all the healthy people are kind of going up and staying there, or most of them. My depressed people are often tanking. This is, she loved me, she loved me, she left me, and I'll never have that again. Their mood falls over seven minutes as they turn the positive things negative. Where in the brain? As your mood is increasing, all those prefrontal regulatory mechanisms are shutting off. You're letting yourself go there. In my depressed people, especially when mood is unchanging, that's when you're engaging regulation. So it's not that depressed people have a lesion. They, can't, they don't have a regulatory capability. It's they're using it at a different time. They're regulating positive information. I don't deserve that. I shouldn't feel that. Negative information they don't regulate. So that's sort of the conception we'll go into our psychotherapy with. Psychotherapies, in general, help people to not do what they do automatically. That is, if depressed people ruminate automatically, and that's mostly what they do, client-centered therapy might ask you, so can you label that, which interrupts that automatic reaction a little bit. Um, interpersonal therapy says, who would you talk to? Cognitive behavioral therapy says, let's explicitly interrupt that. Think, what are you thinking? Is there any evidence for that thought? What's the evidence against it? Is there another more helpful thought you could have? It's interrupting that automatic negative thinking with alternative strategies. Who would it work for? And how would it work? Well, first question, would it affect the brain? A lot of my patients tell me, Doc, I, I think I should take medications. I know that affects the brain. I don't know about psychotherapy. I said, oh, do you think psychotherapy changes your thinking? Well, yeah. OK, and what part of the brain is doing that? Or what part of you is doing that? And they get around to the brain. But at least two years ago, Fruin published a nice review showing that when you give people psychotherapy, a lot of the brain changes. And it's a lot of the areas we've been talking about today that are changing 